Hey guys, what's up? It is Ripe again, back with a mix of revenge and malicious compliance stories. Without wasting any more time, let's dive right into the stories. The first one is titled, Neighbor excavated my property and leveled everything without permission to put up new water lines. $400,000 tree law revenge. I wanna start this story off by saying that I've always been a respectful person and would never go out of my way to sue someone, especially my neighbor, if I did not feel like I was forced to. But boy, did he piss my wife off and I'll admit I was mad too, but she was fuming. We live on a large lot with several lateral water lines present on my property that belong to my surrounding neighbors. Not only does my property include the lateral water lines, but there is a small utility easement as well that runs south to north on the east side of my property. That's not a big deal and in the past my south facing neighbor had to come onto my land to have his water line repaired, only he talked to me first and made sure to do it the right way. That was not what happened with our other neighbor to the west though. That neighbor also had issues with his lateral water line breaking, the pipes were old and this happens after 50 years, so it is no surprise. Only the big surprise to me was the way that he chose to handle it. This man had owned a minor construction slash handiwork company for many years and kept small excavators and backhoes in his barn. No big deal until he decided to just plow through my property with his machinery to access the utility easement. The trench was huge and I had no idea how my yard would ever look the same afterwards. My property was pretty big, my backyard alone was at least an acre and there were dozens of trees, young and old, along with several other plants and nature located in the back part of my yard. I'm sure to him he always felt like it was overgrown, but I kept the brush to a minimum and I enjoyed watching the wildlife that lived in it while I had my morning coffee. My wife especially loved to watch over the little family of cardinals that she had been feeding and providing houses for for almost a year. I was somewhat aware that something had happened to his waterline when I saw plumbing trucks come and go over a 24 hour period. Then I caught him meandering around my property early the next morning, apparently looking to see where he could dig. When I saw this I thought it would be a good idea to talk to him for my own curiosity and my property's protection, but when I came back after changing into normal clothes he was already gone. Nothing seemed to be going on for a few days so I nearly forgot about it, but that was until Friday rolled around. My wife and I started our day like usual, having our breakfast and coffee before leaving for work, that afternoon my wife arrived home first and what she found in the backyard was devastating. She called me on my way home crying with rage. She said that our neighbor had taken his excavator and dug a huge trench through our yard demolishing most of the wooded area and the nearly 30 trees that were present. Even after seeing the wreck that was our yard, her biggest concern was her little family of cardinals whose birdhouse was tossed carelessly to the side. I was in shock and even more so when I actually laid eyes on the mess. Still, to this day, I have a hard time understanding his thought process. Why would you not speak to me first? Anytime I asked, he did not care. I confronted him once I arrived home, he was working with several other men, assuming his employees. When I asked him what he was doing, he seemed to casually brush me off, almost like I was simply an annoyance at the moment. When I pointed out that this was my yard and he had no right to dig a giant trench through it, he shrugged his shoulders and told me that this was a prescriptive easement and he had rights to access it to fix his water line. Firstly, why don't you fix your water line instead of going out of your way to hook it up to this other utility easement? When I asked this he told me that I would have to call a lawyer if I wanted to do anything about it. There was not much talking to him as he felt like he understood the laws and I didn't. However, I was not afraid to give him crap for his poor neighbor etiquette. You could not at least talk to me first, shake my hand maybe? Nope, not worth it according to him, he claimed that legally he had rights to do this to my yard and he did not see the point in wasting his time getting my permission. When I mentioned that maybe he could have done it out of common courtesy, he actually laughed at me. I told him to go F himself and that he would hear from my lawyer. I'll admit it was probably a line I had heard in movies but it still felt good to say it. 
When I contacted a lawyer, they were quick to tell me all of the things I needed to make our case. One of the first things was to have the land appraised as well as an arborist to give cost on the trees that he had cut down. I had no idea how much money trees cost, but when I mentioned how many were destroyed by his excavation, the lawyer nearly jumped for joy. Apparently trees cost a ton of money, especially when you have over two dozen mature oak and cherry trees. After gathering more documents on my deed and the city's utility lines were identified along with the easement, we were finally able to go after him. From my lawyer's research and the information we were getting from his lawyer, we discovered that the claim of a prescriptive easement was unfounded considering he had never used the land until he chose to excavate it. The so-called easement by necessity was almost valid, but the fact that he chose to begin his work without actually communicating with the water company really hurt him. In court he did stand a chance, the judge was somewhat sympathetic to him needing to repair his water lines, only she said that he did not approach it in the correct manner. She really laid into him asking him why he felt like he had the right to destroy my property without even speaking with me first. Ha! Does not pay to be a douchebag anymore, does it? While my neighbor knew that I would be suing him for the damages, he did not realize that I would be including the cost of the trees too. I was actually floored by the arborist's estimate of how much the trees were amounting to almost $400,000. And yes, you heard that right, I could not believe it. When my lawyer handed over the arborist's paperwork to the judge, the look she gave my neighbor was almost one of pity. Well, if you were not in trouble before, here's the total bill for the mature trees you cut down. My neighbor's face was pale and I thought he would faint after hearing the number. Instead of offering to pay him that full monetary amount, I suggested that he could pay some of it back by performing yard work and planting new trees and vegetation where he had run through everything. He almost looked annoyed that I had suggested it, but what is he going to do? Pay back 400k? In the end, he did have to give us around $250,000, but the rest he swore he would pay us back in physical work. I was surprised that he stuck to his word, coming over weekly to cut the grass, weeding the flower beds and planting various different shrubs and trees in the yard. My wife even had him hang up the birdhouses he had ripped down and thrown into our yard without a care. This went on for an agreed amount of time, which was about six years. As soon as the contract was up, he immediately moved, never spoke to us again. Maybe he has learned his lesson about being a crappy neighbor. And yeah, ripe stars, I'm curious, what would you have done if one of your neighbors decided to dig a giant trench through your property, obviously without your permission, while destroying your trees? I gotta say, the neighbor in this story almost got off lightly, I would say, because it was so outrageous what he did. Anyway, let us know what you would do and if you haven't already, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we are super close to 70,000 subscribers. Thank you so much in advance. The next one is a petty revenge story and it starts like this. I was waiting at the elevators, did not take too long since my apartment building is not that big. I get inside and right when the door closes, a hand pushes through. She looked like your typical middle-aged Karen, she presses the 17th floor and she takes one look at my floor which was on the second. She scoffs, glares at me and says, the second floor? Really? Did not take much to piss me off. Her comment was so unnecessary and uncalled for, who cares if it was the second floor? It's my decision whether to take the stairs or not. I just finished an overnight shift and I was exhausted. I guess my exhaustion made me extra moody because when I reached my floor she was scrolling through her phone. I quickly run my hands through as much buttons as I could and said, have fun Karen, right when the door closes. And because I was extra exhausted, therefore extra moody and petty, I pressed the up button when the elevator barely reached the third floor, so I can use the other elevator and press a bunch of buttons again to further inconvenience her just in case she needed to get off on the third floor to take the other elevator. Take the stairs then, if it is not that big of a deal. Just don't be rude to your neighbor for riding the elevators to the second floor. You don't know if they are exhausted or if they have non-visible health conditions that make it hard for them to take the stairs.
The next one is another petty revenge story and it starts like this. My next door neighbor is a Karen who recently adopted a few dogs. At first there was no issue, but then my driveway and lawn started getting more and more dog crap. Everyone who has dogs is very good at picking up after their pets, except for Karen. She denies it is her dog, despite security footage showing it is clearly her and her damn dogs. The dogs are not trained well, Karen does not use leashes because they are barbaric, and sadly there is no law where we live about dogs being on leashes. She also put them on vegan diets, which is clearly not doing well for the dogs. Karen also leaves the dogs in her backyard and they bark at everything. We tried calling the police, but they don't do anything. The entire neighborhood is fed up with her. One day, another neighbor is having a barbecue and the aroma wafts over to her house. Karen gets pissed and heads over to the neighbor's house and gives them a lecture about animals and other stuff. At this point we all have had enough of Karen's holier than thou attitude, seven homes surrounding Karen decided to make Karen's days from this point on miserable. Since it is summer and we are all stuck at home, we all decide to start cooking outdoors. Some homes purposely get barbecue grills and smokers. I myself turned my fire pit into kitchen number one, every day at least one of us is cooking some glorious meat dish and the aroma goes straight to Karen's home. I try to cook at least one thing outside, especially if it is extra aromatic. We all have plenty of wood, thanks to our neighbor, who recently took down a dead tree and gave everyone wood. A lot of wood. Karen complains and even tries to call the police, but obviously we are doing nothing wrong. I just got some brisket to smoke for 16 hours and my other neighbor plans to roast an entire pig. And the next one is a malicious compliance story. Several years ago, I was working logistics and materials coordination on a very large project. We had manufacturing hubs in several Southeast Asian countries and were regularly sending material to and from the far north of Australia and to those places. Because the planners were not the sharpest tools in the shed and because the project director really did not bother listening to planning anyway, we wound up with a lot of stuff in Australia when it should have been in Thailand for example. This is a bad thing and needs to be fixed yesterday. Side note, it was a bad thing because the project director decided to alter the manufacturing schedule to save a few dollars. Okay, actually a lot of dollars, but it really threw a massive spanner in the works. The decision gets made to do a charter flight on one of the big Antonovs. You know, the kind that costs a million bucks to reposition and burn $50,000 per hour in fuel. The costs were accurate back in the day anyway, they are more expensive now. So I start putting together an inventory list of everything that needs to go across. Over the course of several weeks, the email CC list grows to about 50 people who all want to buy in and need their crap sent across urgently. There is also a growing inventory in Thailand that needs to come back. So now we are up to three charter flights both there and back again. About 11 million dollars. Chump change. So as I am planning the fourth of the three charter flights, the project director is also flipping his crap about how much this is costing. The instruction from higher ups is to make 100% sure that everything that needs to go on this last charter goes on and that nothing is left behind. Well, I've got everyone on the list on speed dial at this stage, so I send out an alert that I am sending out a materials list spreadsheet for everything that is going on in this final plane. All people are required to review and respond and that none response will be taken as endorsement of the list because we are on a strict deadline. Everything gets packed up by the crew in Darwin, plane takes off and we all pat ourselves on the back as the plane leaves at about 11 pm on a Friday night. And the phone is ringing. What the hell? Dave. This is Dave in Thailand. They are a few hours behind Australia and I don't see Valve XYZ123 on the manifest. Me? That's because it is not on the manifest. Everything was loaded onto the plane according to the spreadsheet I sent out several times over the past week. Let me check. You were copied in an acknowledged receipt of the emails on date and date. Dave, we need that Valve in Thailand to complete the punch list for PAM907. Here it is worthwhile to point out that PAM907 was on the critical path and was utterly necessary for the plan to operate. 
Delivery on time formed part of all the senior management KPIs and therefore bonus. Me, it is not on the plane. Looking at the records, the valve is still at sight. Dave, that valve needs to get on the plane. Get a truck to sight and drive it to the airport. The sight is 700 kilometers, 500 miles from the airport and it is midnight on Friday night. Me, Dave, the plane left three hours ago. We cannot get the valve on the plane. Dave, that Evan Valve needs to get to Thailand by Monday or PAM 907 is not sailing. So just find a way. Click. PAM 907 was coming via a barge and sailed next Friday. There was no way that we could get the valve to Thailand on a commercial flight by the end of the week and certainly not enough time to install, test and sign off. So I turned to my long-suffering co-worker and miracle worker JC. JC was a Latin American legend who knew logistics inside and out and if anyone could make the impossible happen, it was him. Me, JC, JC, okay. Me, great job on the charter by the way, but Dave in Thailand says that a valve did not make it on board. JC, it's not my problem, plane already in the air. Me, Dave says that the valve is required for PIM 907. We have to get it there by Monday morning so they can install it, test and get the PIM on the barge. JC is smart cookie. He knows what this means. JC swears in Spanish for about 5 minutes straight. I don't speak the language but I'm pretty sure he did not repeat himself. JC, call that cow puta crap for brains back and tell him that he needs to get project director's sign off to turn the plane around. Me, damn, okay. Ring ring, Dave. What? Me, you need to get project director's approval to turn the charter plane around. Dave, what the f? No way. Me, it's not possible to put the valve on a commercial plane and have it there by Friday, let alone in time to install and test. Dave, I don't want to hear it. Just get that valve here. I don't care what you have to do. Me, I will need that in writing. Dave, fine. I get the mail in writing and call my boss. JC is still swearing, boss has the unenviable task of waking up project director and explaining the situation. JC gets to turn the plane around, I get to wake up crew in Darwin to move the valve. Plane lands, valve is loaded, plane leaves, Dave's contract is not renewed. And the next one is also a malicious compliance story. For reference, I process home loans that come to our company via a mortgage broker. So customer comes to mortgage broker for a loan, mortgage broker searches for the right home loan and comes to us the lender. Mortgage broker is our client. We recently had a client that decided to withdraw the loan application as the valuation on the property was not as high as the broker slash client wanted it to be, meaning that the customer had to pay more out of their pocket for their new property. As part of this loan application, the customer also submitted a form for a subsidy called First Homeowner Grant FHOG. This is a government grant that helps people buy their first home and has strict guidelines to who can apply. While not particular to the lender, it is a document that is full of personal information that we are legally obliged to protect under the Privacy Act. When this loan did not proceed, we were sent an email by the customer's new financier, competitor bank requesting we send the FHOG document over to them so they can lodge for the customer. Our answer was no, we will send it to the broker who supplied it to us or the client only. As per our privacy act, we will not supply documents to a third party that is not related to our dealings with the customer. Competitor banks should know this, it is the law and the banks as well as individuals can face hefty fines. Now I was the lucky one to get the call from the broker who supplied the document to us initially. She is accusing us of deliberately not sending the document because we were not awarded the loan in the first place. I tell her as above, read Privacy Act. We can mail to client or her. She screams that the other bank needs it today, mailing will take too long and said, you will have someone walk this document over to competitor bank today. Me, no, I cannot have that happen. Rinse and repeat, privacy. I offer that the document can be collected from our head office by client or broker. Her, client is in another state, not possible. 
I would send a person from competitor bank to collect. Me, rinse and repeat in regards to privacy, her, after more accusations, you know what, I think I will collect it myself. I hear a real sarcastic tone in her voice. I know she planned on sending someone from competitor bank to come to us and just say they were her. Me, oh excellent, I will tell reception that you will collect it. Please ensure you have your ID on you as we will not hand it over unless we know it is you. Her, stunned silence, me, what time do you anticipate arriving? Just so I can let the reception know. Her, um, um, I, I'm driving from the Gold Coast, so, um, about one and a half hours, I guess, because, uh, traffic. Me, excellent, we will see you then. K, thanks, bye. And ripe stars with this we have reached the end of the video, however if you still cannot get enough of my content then I would highly suggest to check out my endless binge watch playlist which will soon show up in the left corner of the screen. In addition I would really appreciate it if you could not only subscribe to the channel but also turn on the bell notifications which you can do by clicking on the little bell icon right next to the subscribe button. This will help my channel tremendously and this will make sure that you don't miss any of my videos. Furthermore if you want to see additional ripe content that I don't post on YouTube then I would suggest to head on over to patreon.com slash ripe YouTube for more than 50 50 exclusive videos that you will not see anywhere else. Thank you so much for your amazing daily support and I hope to see you again tomorrow.